This is our livelihood. This is what we do. We're going to be in this for a long time. And so you really want to be with someone who's going to be with you. MedFlow, developing the future of eye care through client-inspired products. Come visit MedFlow booth 1635 to learn how you can become a lifelong partner. The 73rd annual Jackson Memorial Lecture was delivered by Dr. Douglas Koch on the enigmatic cornea and IOL calculations. Dr. Koch discussed the difficulties in measuring the anterior surface of the cornea, like tear film and corneal pathology. The posterior surface can also be tricky, especially when selecting toric IOLs. Dr. Koch's advice is simple. You should never make assumptions. But for patients who have had LASIK, penetrating keratoplasty, DSEC, patients with ectasia, then in those situations we can't measure the anterior cornea and then make assumptions about what is the actual posterior corneal power. We measure patients with more than one device, critically look at the raw data that you get from your devices, whether it's reflection, reflections of Myers or standard deviations, and if there's any question, treat the corneal surface, remeasure, and remeasure. First year was Orlando, Chicago was year two. I'm really gonna miss this opening gig with you. Oh, oh, oh. oh baby, I don't want to go. It's my last annual meeting in Sweet Home, Chicago. Leave it to the 2016 Annual Meeting Secretary, Dr. Jonathan Rubenstein, to both open the general session and close out his role as secretary with a Chicago Blues performance. It's been an honor to be involved in this position as secretary for the annual meeting. For most of the membership, when they hear the word the American Academy of Ophthalmology, they think of the annual meeting. It's really the face of our organization. So, first of all, just to have the opportunity to be involved in the process has been really wonderful, and it's been an honor to do that. Um, we've had, I think the meeting has really grown over the past six years. We've had an emphasis on trying to have more, more small uh, based learning environments. We've created things like a learning lounge, which is a small environment where you can have maybe only 15, 20 people talk to the individual presenter and it's much more of an, an exchange versus just a lecture. We've changed our lecture rooms to be some of them more circular, some of them uh, with more aisles and things to make the whole process more inclusive. We've tried to get more case-based presentations involved, so there's, there's again, interchange between the audience and the presenter. Um, we've continued the Academy Cafes, another small kind of venue. So I think a lot of those innovations towards trying to make the meeting much more uh, able to reach out and touch it and much more accessible to people, more interchange, more exchange between the presenters and the audience, I think that's been very, very important. 2016 Academy President Dr. Bill Rich reflected on his nearly 40-year career as an ophthalmologist as he prepares to retire. He said he deeply values his practice, his patients, and his role with the Academy. Also in the opening session, a panel discussed the new physician payment system effective January 1st, 2017. The final rule that explains the program was released October 14th, 2016. Physician reimbursement will now be based on quality of care. Physicians will be graded on four different categories. For information on the final rule and resources to help you manage this new payment system, go to aao.org slash Medicare. If you do nothing, then you are um, subject to a 4% penalty on your payments. Based on what you do from 2017, uh, in 2019, your payments will be affected. Uh, but there is an upside, there is an opportunity for bonus. We don't completely know those details yet, but there will be an opportunity in variations of how you participate, if you participate fully or if you participate in a partial way. Iris Registry is the best way to succeed in MIPS because you can use the same quality measures that you are already reporting in Iris. For more information on joining the Iris Registry, visit aao.org slash irisregistry. It's very important to manage the vitreous so it doesn't cause further retina complications such as tears or detachment. 
In one of the Skills Transfer Labs offered at AAO 2016, ophthalmologists who perform cataract surgery were able to learn new ways of managing the vitreous with techniques such as where to place the cutter, how to maneuver tools, and how to clean it up well. I approach it anteriorly, although we close the main wound, let's say for cataract surgeons, close often the main wound with one suture and then um, use um, a vitrector and an irrigation cannula to really clean up the vitreous anteriorly. Although in the course we do show how to place uh, a port um, sort of posterior to the lens and clean it from, do the anterior vitrectomy from the uh, base of the uh, vitreous or more posterior to the lens implant as well. Working on the vitreous may not be routine for some cataract surgeons. Here they get hands-on experience to sharpen their skills with the aid of expert instructors. Uh, the best tip was uh, for me, having not utilized them before using the trocars uh, to uh, make the vitrectomy a little easier and hopefully a little safer. It's good to have a setting like this uh, where you can take your time and really learn the nuances of the technique without the pressure of a real patient. New this year at AAO 2016 is the inaugural Arnold Patz Lecture, and I'm joined now by Dr. Paul Sternberg, who is going to be giving that lecture. Congratulations. Thank you, Rachel. Why don't you tell us first a little bit about who Arnold Patz was? Well, it certainly is a privilege to be honoring Dr. Patz. Dr. Patz passed away about uh, in, in 2010, but he was really one of the most remarkable men in American ophthalmology. He grew up in a small town in, in Georgia uh, and then went into private practice in Washington, D.C. While he was there, he did really the first clinical trial in ophthalmology. He showed that uh, high oxygen levels were associated with a premature baby uh, having retinal detachments and going blind. By lowering the oxygen, they didn't. And, and that was really our first study that, that created really robust evidence that we could make a difference in terms of treating patients with different blinding diseases. He went on to become the chairman at uh, Johns Hopkins. He was uh, president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and was regaled with honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. What an excellent man in the field of ophthalmology. So what does it mean for you to be giving this lecture? Well, a couple things. First of all, um, my first research experience in ophthalmology was in Arnold Patz's lab. As a medical student, uh, I was asked, I, I told my chairman, which was in Chicago, I wanted to be an ophthalmologist, and he said, whose lab do you want to work in? And I said, well, gosh, I have no idea. He said, well, go back, read about different people, and come back and tell me who you want to work with. And when I saw the work that he was doing to try to prevent abnormal blood vessel growth in the eye, to prevent blinding diseases like diabetes and macular degeneration, said, that's where I want to go. So I worked in his lab, and then a few years later, I was fortunate enough to be accepted to be a resident at Johns Hopkins, and he at that point was the chairman. So he was my chairman, he was my lab mentor, and then a few years later, I was chief resident and worked under him. So we had this incredible relationship that started as student, professor, and then became colleagues and friends. What an honor then for you to be giving this. Particularly amazing honor, yeah. Yes. Can you give us a little preview of what you're going to be talking about? Well, it's always challenging when you have someone who's in whose name you're going to be honoring and also being the inaugural lecture. So what I thought I'd talk about is evidence-based medicine, which we hear more and more about and its importance in, in healthcare. And since this was something that he helped almost invent in ophthalmology, I thought it would be valuable to reflect on how we use evidence in our treatment decisions, how well and sometimes how poorly we're able to take what we learn from good trials and implement them in our day-to-day -day practice. And you were mentioning a little bit of the importance of evidence-based medicine, so why is this becoming more and more relevant? Sure. When we think about uh, the challenges we face in healthcare, obviously rising healthcare costs is, is, is a significant problem, and some of it is due to poor access to care, but a lot of it is due to the fact that we don't always do what we should be doing. And, and the question is, why is that? Is it because we don't know it? Is it because maybe there's a, a financial incentive to do something differently? Or is it because we disagree with it. So the importance is that if we do regularly apply evidence-based care, we will both provide better outcomes at a lower cost for a population. And we have to be thinking about that and doing it better every day. Thank you so much. I'm Rachel Kopchak here at AAO 2016.
We've walked the extensive exhibit floor and seen the latest advances being made in the field of ophthalmology. Now we want to know what's been the coolest thing you've seen here at AAO 2016. The coolest thing I've seen at the show today are some of the new EMR systems and I'm still shopping around so we'll see what we find. The coolest thing that I have seen in the show is the Heidelberg anterior segment OCT. They just take a picture of the whole entire eye for um, cornea, lens um, and everything else. Uh, I think this uh, new micropulse, you know, glaucoma treatments uh, are very promising, you know, the mix, the, the you know, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery technologies uh, is certainly something that I'm looking forward to implementing in my practice. The coolest thing I've seen in the show this time was a project that my colleagues and I have been working on and it's come to full fruition, it's published in a book, so we're excited about that. I'm looking forward to trying some of the new presbyopic inlays like the raindrop and camera. What surprised me the most about the show is the tremendous offerings. I could occupy every single minute that this uh, convention is going, this meeting is going, and still not scratch the surface of what I you know, would like to get out of it. So, and that seems to be so much greater than it was 20 or 30 years ago, you know, so this is terrific. The 2017 annual meeting will have a new secretary and I'm joined by her right now, Dr. Maria Aaron. What are you most looking forward to in your new role? So this is an exciting opportunity. The annual meeting is a place where we get to share diverse educational opportunities to a variety of attendees. Our attendees are of every age, race, gender, and it's nice to be able to provide various opportunities for different learning styles depending on the individual. So creating an atmosphere where we can have inter interactive learning environments, more traditional symposium, small group sessions, pre and post tests for those that like those, team-based learning, and just creating a culture of inquiry and innovation where we can share ideas and pass those ideas not only to our colleagues but also to our patients. Can you give us maybe a little preview of some of the new things you might be incorporating next year at the annual meeting? So we'd like to have more blended education where we've got both um, online modules at the same time that you're hearing a lecture, um, more interactive sessions where we've got very small groups with more hands-on learning atmospheres I think will be attractive to our younger generations of Millennials which are becoming more and more the population that the meeting is targeted towards. And can we expect any sort of performances from you maybe as we've seen from Dr. Rubenstein? So Dr. Rubenstein has quite a number of talents and my talents are limited <laughs> but I'm sure we'll come up with something that's entertaining for the group. Yes. And you're also a Dean of Education, of Medical Education at Emory. Uh, what got you into teaching and educating medical students? So the rewards of teaching are incredible. Teaching can make such a huge impact um, on so many individuals. And watching an individual um, learn something that you've taught them, pass that on to other generations and to their patients, um, is extremely rewarding. So I've always been passionate about education and in my new role I now get to educate over 1200 residents. So it's a big job but it's it's very rewarding and, and enjoyable. Well I hope you enjoy it and enjoy your role as secretary. Thank you for your time. I'm Rachel Kopchak here at AAO 2016. Thank you for watching our coverage of AAO 2016. I'm Rachel Kopchak. We'll see you in New Orleans in 2017. Experience an EHR like never before with Emma, the system built by ophthalmologists. Document quickly and draw with complete freedom. Plus, unify your records in the cloud with integrated image management. Visit booth 4017 to see for yourself.